Hi all, and welcome to Chess News number 42. Today I want to take a look at the game that yesterday won Vishwana Zanananth the Grenke Chess Classic in Baden-Baden, Germany. In the end it seemed as though Caruana would catch up with him in the standings, and thereby forcing a playoff, but his endgame advantage never materialized after having passed up a nice winning chance. So, uh, back to the game at hand. It is Neidich playing with white pieces and Anand with black. So Neidich opened up with e4 and Anand uh, answered with the Sicilian defense. Now they play a number of theory moves. Um, Neidich opts here for the bishop b5 line, so sidestepping some more sharp variations, which occur of course after d2, d4 which complex is called the open Sicilian. Uh, Anand responds here with bishop d7, bishop takes d7, queen takes d7. And um, I think it's actually quite nice uh, to note that not so long ago Anand lost a game in this variation playing with black against uh, Carlsen. Carlsen really uh, kind of crushed him in a very beautiful game but I'm pretty sure that uh, Anand came better prepared in this line uh, this time. So Neidich plays here c4, setting up uh, a Maroxi bind, which will uh, materialize in a few moves. Knight f6, knight c3, and g6. This is all very normal. I think there's also another chess news here somewhere on Chessatelic, featuring a game with the exact same variation between Ivanchuk and Shirov. I can recommend you look up that game also, uh, which has a little bit, bit more insight into this uh, theoretical variation also. So here white goes, d4, and now after c takes d4 and knight takes d4, we have this typical uh, Maroxi bind uh, set up with the two pawns on c4 and uh, e4, really clamping down on the b5 and d5 squares, making it quite difficult uh, for black to, to break out. He is suffering from uh, a little bit lack of space, but of course after bishop b5 check and bishop d7 and the exchange on d7, black has also managed to exchange off one pair of minor pieces, so his lack of space is not that big a deal. So bishop g7, nicely developing the bishop on the long diagonal, and now after castles, knight c6, Knight d e2, safeguarding the knight from exchange because white still has some sort of uh, a space advantage. Uh, Anand played queen e6. And this is a, an interesting move. And um, this move was played before in the very famous game between Kasparov with white and the world with black that was played on the internet in 1999. Um, in the text accompanying this video, you can find a link uh, to that game, which was a game of a very high level, which Kasparov managed uh, to win in the end, but um, as he himself also said, uh, the world had shown some uh, very high level chess there and uh, helped him in creating a very interesting uh, chess game. So, uh, that game continues in the same way as uh, this game uh, continues. Now, please note that the queen is attacking both the c4 and uh, the e4 uh, pawns, but as so often in chess, um, the party that is attacked can react with a counterattack, and that is what Nadich does here. He ignores the attack on c4 and uh, on e4, and he goes for the counterattack with knight d5, simply threatening to win the game immediately by giving uh, what we call a family check, right, or the royal uh, fork. Um, queen e4 was played, so Anand simply disregards the check on c7, but of course this is all very well known and was also played in this game uh, between Kasparov and the world. So knight h continued with knight c7 now uh, forcing black to give to give up the uh, right to castle and winning the exchange in uh, the corner. 
But as we can see, the knight on a8 is trapped and it will not be able to make it out of the corner alive. So in between, Anand also now first captures the pawn on uh, c4 and now currently has two pawns for the black rook. Um, now the aforementioned game saw knight b6 check, again delivering the royal fork when the world was forced to recapture of course or to take the knight with a takes b6 and uh, they continued uh, playing uh, from there. But now in the game after queen takes c4 knight each uh, deviates and he decides to activate his knight from e2 to c3. Now this gives Anand the opportunity uh, to take back the knight in the corner and this will give us the opportunity uh, to take some stock here. If we take a look at the position we can see that uh, material is imbalanced because uh, black has two pawns and a knight for the rook but according to the point counting system uh, both sides have five points in the balance so you could say material is imbalanced, but on the other hand it's also even, right? If we take a look at another important factor that you normally use when uh, assessing positions, uh, we can take a look at uh, the safety of both kings. Now the king's safety is better for white, uh, quite obviously so, because he has uh, a classical castle position and his three uh, king side pawns are nicely protecting him. Uh, on the other hand, the black king is sitting here in the center and even though he has some protection from his D and E pawn, he must be fully aware of the fact that both central files are uh, completely open, at least from the white uh, perspective. So this means that uh, the, the black king will be vulnerable to, to tricks and pins over these um, open central files. So king safety is better for white and uh, worse for black. Now let's take a look uh, at a third uh, factor which is peace activity. I would say that currently the peace activity is better for black and uh, I actually did a count currently black controls no less than 67 squares on the board and if you just figure out the activity of the pieces and the squares that are controlled by these pieces and white currently only controls 52 squares so this means that black is up hugely in this uh, comparison uh, with no less than 15 points so black controls 15 more squares than white and that says a lot about his uh, superior piece activity and then um, we can also take a look at the pawn structure, which is another uh, important factor, of course. I guess pawn structures are fine for both, right? Uh, neither side has any significant pawn weaknesses. Of course, black has two more, but white is up the exchange. So, it all now boils down to the next questions. First, can white make use of his extra exchange, right? The extra rook. Two, can white make use of the position of the black king in the center? And three, can black make use of his better peace activity? And four, can black make use of his central pawn majority and start controlling more squares by pushing these pawns and taking away central squares from the white pieces? So, I guess it all boils down to uh, those four questions. And um, some things to do for both sides. Uh, for white, for instance, it would be nice if he can win some tempi against black's queen, which is sitting there quite nicely in the center, but again also quite vulnerable on c4. Um, he would also like to pin the central pawns against the black king, so that's something that he can try and do. And uh, for black, some things to do would be to trade queens so that the black king will feel much more safe and also be justified in the center uh, for any possible uh, end game, for instance. And uh, last but not least, um, both sides need to develop uh, or finish their development 
which for black means that he basically needs to put his rook on the C file, and for white this means that he has to put his rooks on open files C, D or E, and of course develop the bishop also to a decent square. Okay, now what I just did was talk for about five minutes about uh, the position, right? It was time to take stock. Uh, the opening has come to an end. There was a forced sequence, there was a trade-off, and now what is going on on the position? I think many chess players actually forget to do this and also most of the time are not completely sure when they are supposed to do this. But I think it's very important to take stock so that you know what you can do in the middle game. You somehow have to devise of a plan and um, taking stock of the position, seeing what your balances, your favorite imbalances are and the ones for the uh, opponent can really help you decide on what you actually need uh, to do. So in this case, by trying to create uh, some sort of a to-do list or, or a plan, you at least have a map guiding you through um, the chaos of, of, of the middle game, right? In, in this case, at least you know where to go, uh, know in general what to strive for and what to uh, avoid, instead of just going from move to move. So I think this is a very helpful uh, thing. And, um, well, please try and uh, remember that and uh, put it into practice in your own games also. So, now let's see, <laughs> this is a little bit cocky of me, let's see if Maidich and Anand listened to what I just explained about the position. Okay, here we go. Maidich plays bishop g5. Well, I would say that's a fine move, right, because he is finishing his development. He is putting his bishop in a very active uh, position, putting pressure on the knight on f6 and the pawn on e7. And also, of course, preparing the development of his rook to c1, where it could also harass uh, the black queen. Now, um, I guess that Anand could now have continued with either rook c8, which finishes his development, or with a move like h6, which also follows a very important principle in chess, namely that if you do not activate your own pieces, you should at least try and deactivate your opponent's pieces. And since the bishop on g5 is really taking up a, an aggressive position, it would be quite a good idea to play h6 uh, here also. Um, I think from a, a strictly theoretical point of view, both rook c8 and h6 were more direct. The move that Anand played, however, in the game is also playable, but it's a little bit scary uh, at, at the same time. So I suppose that he um, calculated it all uh, very precisely. Instead of playing uh, rook c8 or h6, he played e6. Now what I don't like so much about this move is that it weakens the black squares in the center. Uh, e7, e6, e5 and uh, of course the knight on f6 which now no longer is protected by uh, the pawn on e7. But I think that uh, Anand already foresaw uh, one of the following trade-offs that he will uh, play soon, but as I mentioned he had to be very precise because a knight it could have played now, for instance, queen f3. Uh, attacking the knight on f6 for the second time and behind it also the undeveloped f7 pawn. So in this particular case there is only one move that Anand could have played and that is queen g4. Of course, this idea is based on that, and try to visualize that, if white now plays bishop takes f6, that uh, black will uh, first exchange queens in between on f3. And then after that, he can safely recapture on f6 with his uh, bishop, ruining white's pawn structure in the process. So in this case, uh, white, if he wants to maintain some sort of advantage, uh, he should sidestep because, um, of course, black wants to trade queens, as we uh, decided earlier, and white does not want to do that. 
So uh, this would have been a, a possible uh, continuation. Of course, uh, Nidic uh, saw all this and he decided uh, to play uh, something else instead. Now, <coughs> to try and explain Nidic's uh, next move, I think it's important to also take a look at what happens if he would take on f6 immediately. So not play queen f3, but take on f6 immediately. Again, trying to make use of the weakness uh, over the f-file in black's camp. Of course, black would be forced to recapture. And now, again, queen f3. In this case, the bishop could not move, because then uh, the pawn on f7 would fall. So in this case, uh, really, black would be forced to play king e7, which holds everything together. But now use your imagination. If there were a white rook on the e-file pinning the e-pawn to the king, then all of a sudden in this particular uh, position white would be able to win the game immediately by playing knight d5 check. Now, since the e-pawn is pinned, uh, the e-pawn cannot take the knight on d5, but also the queen cannot take the knight on d5, because white would take that queen on d5, right? Again, also in that situation, the e-pawn is, of course, pinned. So, black would have to move his king, and then, of course, knight d5 takes f6, immediately winning the game. So, in order to prepare this idea, after e6, knight each first played rook e1. And I've created uh, a number of arrows again to show you um, what the ideas are here. Okay, um, of course Anand sees everything uh, coming and he is sort of feeling the heat right now, right? And uh, he tries to relieve the pressure on his position by playing knight d5. Now we will um, discuss this move in a minute. Let's first take a look at some other uh, options. There was of course also the idea of playing queen g4 which again resonates with the idea of trying to exchange queens but then I guess white would just play queen d2 protecting his bishop on g5 and uh, try and harass uh, the black king uh, maybe by playing rook ad1 and putting some pressure here on, on d6. Also he would be able maybe to force away uh, the black queen and win some tempi in, in that way. And um, just to show you exactly what would happen if after rook e1 uh, black would make some sort of a null move like a6 then, of course, White would be able to execute his plan, as I just uh, showed you uh, before here. Queen f3. Now, after king e7, knight d5 would follow, winning immediately. So, after queen f3, black would be forced to play bishop e7, but then, of course, White crashes through on f7, and rook f8 doesn't really help, since after queen takes h7, there is no good follow-up here for black and uh, white has a huge advantage if not winning. Okay, so having said that, this explains why Anand now goes for the somewhat strange and ugly, but again understandable knight d5. It's this knight on f6 that is in trouble, and also the fact that his central pawns are pinned, so his next move, knight d5, makes some sense. Now let's see how Nidish goes about this. First, he takes the knight, and um, Anand recaptures now with his queen. Because with the queens off, as said earlier, Black's king will feel more secure. And in this concrete situation, queen takes d5 turns out to be uh, the only move, because after e takes uh, d5, which is not according to plan, because black should try and um, exchange queens. White can now also start to make use of this open file, right? So now he is really enjoying the fact that he's up the exchange, which translates to the fact that he has two rooks instead of one. Um, 
because now there is a vulnerable square here on uh, e7, the pawn on d5 is also vulnerable, the queen is vulnerable to attacks by the pawn or by the rook, and if the rook attacks the queen, then he can also eliminate the knight on c6, which in turn is the defender of this e7 square. And if this means that white would be able to break through on the e7 square, uh, check the king and take everything he finds on his path, then of course white would uh, also be winning. So in this particular situation, there are uh, just simply too many threats. And one way to go about it for white would be to play b3. And then if uh, black wants to keep defending his pawn on d5 with, let's say, queen b5, then he would be chased again by means of a4. And now after queen c5, rook c1, the queen d4, very strong, for instance, is also queen f3. And now white has managed to reactivate all his pieces, uh, place them in aggressive positions, and uh, this position is simply untenable for black. So after knight takes d5, queen takes d5 was not only good but also forced. And um, it would have been possible now, of course, for uh, Arkady to try and sidestep the exchange of queens by means of queen g4, but Anand would uh, pursue him uh, by means of queen f5. So in this uh, particular situation, um, excuse me, here after queen takes e5, Nidic decided to exchange queens, and of course he gets something in return, right, after e takes d5. I guess now this is another moment, the second moment in the game, where it is again time to take stock. Material is still in balance, but equal according to the pointing counting system. Still, black has a knight and two pawns for the rook. However, black's pawn position is compromised since he now has a doubled pawn. On the flip side, the queens are off the board and black king feels now really much more secure and uh, centralized. So, in this position, black can really justify his position of the king uh, on d7. Again, let's see if we can create a to-do list uh, for both sides. For white, still applies to try and penetrate on the open files, since he has the extra rook. And, uh, of course, he has to try and block black's free pawn on d5. And he needs to activate his king, because his king is really... Um, um, how to say that? Um, well, less well-placed uh, than, than black's king. So, um, Black, from his part, he needs to try and activate his free pawn, uh, try to promote it if possible. He still needs to activate his own rook, and at the same time, he needs to defend the open files and uh, the seventh rank. For instance, the e7 square is still uh, vulnerable. He cannot really move his uh, knight yet. Okay, well. White now plays rook a d1 and immediately goes for the d-pawn, making use of the fact that both knight e7 uh, and knight b4 are uh, impossible for obvious reasons. Now, it was possible here for Nantes to play a d4, but that somewhat re restricts his knight, which is now bound to the defense of the, the d-pawn, and also blocks um, the bishop on the long diagonal. So instead of playing b4, he now opts for a move that he could have played some moves earlier, namely h6. Again, according to the principle, if it's difficult to um, activate your own pieces, maybe it's a good idea to try and deactivate your opponent's pieces. And there is not really a happy square uh, for this uh, bishop that is attacked on g5. It could go to h4, but then g5 uh, will follow uh, it's not so well or so actively placed on f4, because black would always be able to maybe play knight e5 and simply block the activity of that uh, bishop. And of course on e3 it's in the way of the rook on e1, and it might be harassed by the pawn. 
from d5 coming to d4, and on d2 it is blocking the rook on d1, so knight each in the end decides to go all the way back to c1, and this has the added benefit that it protects the pawn on b2, which was um, uh, attacked by the black bishop on g7. Okay, now let me quickly note that uh, h6 was really uh, the best move here. Um, because if black would to try and counterattack with bishop b2, then all of a sudden after rook b1, bishop c3 for instance, rook b7 check, king c8 and rook e b1, white would really be able to make use of the open files and would be uh, winning all of a sudden. So of course black uh, needs to uh, prevent that kind of thing happening to his position. So back to h6 and bishop c1. And now again, of course, uh, white is still attacking the d-pawn and Anand now sees no better move than just to play d4. Now since white cannot make use of the open files, he now tries to activate one of his rooks by switching along the third rank. He plays rook d3. Of course, there were some other options and maybe some more natural options, such as, for instance, b3 to try and activate the bishop by uh, putting it here and uh, attacking the d-pawn or also to play king of one to try and centralize uh, the king so that it is a little bit closer to that uh, free pawn in any uh, endgame uh, scenario. Okay, back to the game where knight each played rook d3 and now a very natural simple uh, move for an on to play he now finds the opportunity to activate his rook and complete another item on his uh, to-do list. Okay, here goes Nidic, rook b3, attacking the pawn on b7, but that's uh, a problem easily solved. Anand now plays b6, and Nidic now plays king f1, somewhat improving uh, his king. Now here comes a very fine uh, move uh, from Anand, even though it's it's also, I guess, quite a simple and, and easy move to find. But he plays here knight e5, activating both his knight and rook, and threatening rook c2. Now, in chess, it's all about um, square control, right? Uh, in my uh, Better Your Chess Membership uh, program, you can find uh, some in-depth uh, lessons about this uh, subject, explaining you much, much more uh, about it. And uh, in the end, it just boils down to uh, square control. And of course, if you control more squares, then you have an opportunity to break your opponent's uh, army. And if you put uh, a knight in the center of the board like this on e5, it is closer to the white camp and uh, also enables, of course, the rook in this particular case to come all the way down to, to c2, for instance, where it would be ideally placed attacking no less than five pawns on white's uh, second rank. Well, um, for the moment, um, Anidic disregards this and he goes for a, a counterattack, which so often happens in chess. And I guess the counterattack is the single most important type of defense that we always miss when we are attacking our opponent, right? And then we think, oh, we have a strong attack and maybe we're winning, and then they play this counter-attack, and you go like, oh, gosh, I didn't see that, why didn't I reckon with that, you know? So, it's always very important to uh, stay on the lookout for counter-attacks. Okay, well, this uh, problem of the a pawn being threatened also is very easily solved, Anand plays uh, a5. And now, I think Nidic goes astray just a little bit. Of course, Anand is now threatening rook c2 again, right? He solved the problem of his b and a pawn, and he wants to go rook c2. Now, I guess Nidic should try and deal uh, with this uh, threat, and the best way to do was to, again, <laughs> counterattack and try to deactivate the knight that's sitting there so nicely in the center. He could have played f4 here. Now let's take a look at two uh, possibilities. For instance, if Anand would go knight g4, then the knight would be chased back again 
to f6. And now the move that uh, knight each plays in the game before would make much more sense. Uh, another possibility for an aunt would go would be to go knight c4, hitting the rook on a3, but then after rook d3 and b2, b3 to follow, again, he would be chasing back the knight, and uh, still no uh, rook c2 has happened to him. Okay, well, after a5, he played b4, disregarding rook c2, probably um, trusting on a lengthy uh, variation that he tried to calculate as precisely as he could, but it seems to me that he either missed something there or that he just uh, misjudged um, the resulting positions. Because Anand now simply goes for activity, rook c2. Now, of course, it seems that a white now can win a pawn by b takes a5, which in fact happened after rook takes uh, a5. But uh, either an uncalculated better or judged the, the resulting positions better, because this rook takes a5 leads to an inferior endgame. I think slightly better was to prepare rook takes a5 by first stopping uh, another threat that has come into the position, namely the threat of knight d3. And uh, knight each could have done that with rook d1 simply uh, defending this d3 square. Well, as mentioned, in the game he went for rook takes a5, and now, of course, black plunges in with his octopus, attacking half of white's army. It is, of course, now a crisis in white's camp, and he needs to play very precisely. He goes for rook a7 check, and this counterattack is really the only way uh, to maintain somewhat of a balance. King c6 followed and rook takes f7, again a counter attack against the bishop on g7. But here comes Anand, he takes the rook. Now um, it would be wrong to take the bishop on g7 now because after rook takes c1, black is simply a piece up and uh, winning. So after um, knight takes c1, he has to play king takes c1 making use of the fact that after rook takes c1 check, he again has a counter-attack on the rook on c1, maintaining the balance. But now comes a very fine move by Anand, which was probably missed by uh, Nidic or um, misjudged. Rook g1. Very nice. It's also possible, of course, that uh, Nidish thought that he would maybe easily draw the resultant position, even against the world champion, since a uh, well-known saying goes that all rook endgames are drawn, right? The problem, however, is that the endgame may be drawn, but white has to defend and come up with a good concept, which often is a recipe for mistakes, right? Nobody really likes to defend. It's, 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 it's difficult. Okay. So, uh, first of all, he has to recapture my material here on g7, but now after rook takes g2, uh, the smoke has cleared, right? And then game has arisen that is in black's favor. Let's again, for the third time in this game, try and break down the position. Black is a pawn up. Black has an advanced three pawn that can be supported by his king. Both rooks have activity, but blacks is much more active because apart from rook g7, the entire white army is sitting on the second rank, right? And it's very difficult to run away from the second rank with four pieces in one move, right? Because that's illegal, it's against the rules. So you can only move uh, your pieces out of harm's way one at a time. Now, since white cannot afford to let the f-pawn go with check, black wins the h-pawn uh, in return for his own g-pawn, but this leaves him with a second free pawn on the h-file that can storm up the board quite quickly. So, white is now faced with the question of how to deal with his attack on his f-pawn. Okay, now let's see how Nidic deals with this question. He plays king e1, and I think that this is probably already the losing move. Um, 
I would prefer king e2 instead, just on general grounds, because putting the king on the first rank allows black to play a check later on, bringing the h-pawn one square closer to queen, but also, very importantly, allowing for his rook to switch along the first rank. We will see later that this plays a very important role. Uh, apart from king e1, which is the move that I displayed in the game, uh, the counter attack with king d3 uh, I think was uh, was possible. Because after rook takes f2, rook takes g6, rook takes h2, king takes d4 and h5, black may have some winning chances, but I think it is probably still drawn. For instance, um, rook takes a2, rook takes h6 is an immediate draw. So in this case, after h5, I guess it would be better. Um, uh, ex excuse me, after king takes d4, rook takes a2, and rook takes a2 is uh, an immediate draw, so he would have to go for h5, of course. But then white will just put his rook behind uh, the enemy passed pawn, which is a very important principle. And then after h4 um, and uh, king e3, king c5, a4, d5, a5, d4 check, and king e4, uh, black cannot really make uh, progress. For instance, if he wants to move up his king to support the d-pawn with king c4, then rook c6 forces uh, black to let go of his d-pawn. And after king e4, h3, uh, white also has a trump, and he just simply plays a6. Um, one way to continue the struggle then is rook e2 check, but after king e3, rook e3, king c2, uh, white simply uh, holds. Black has to uh, pay attention to the white free a pawn and is also uh, still easily um, keeping the black h pawn at bay. Now in this line it is possible to go wrong for white. Um, if, for instance, instead of king e3, he plays a4. Now, <clears throat> this would be a blunder, maybe as some sort of a natural blunder, because you also want to move your own trump up the board, right? But here comes a well-known trick. Rook a2, and black is winning. Obviously, uh, you cannot take now, because rook takes a4, skewers the king and rook, and is an easy win for black. Okay, so I think that um, over here, after rook takes g2, uh, white would still maintain drawing chances after the counterattack with king d3, or if he would play king e2 and not put his king on the first rank, which he did in the game. Okay, so back to the move in the game, king e1, when there followed rook takes h2, rook takes g6, when black now has a free h pawn and now sees uh, seizes the moment he plays here rook h1 check exclamation mark this is a very handy move which enables a trick that is necessary later on okay um the game continued now with uh, king e2 King e2 does not really seem to make a difference because the same sequence of moves as in the game could have uh, occurred. So let's stick with the game plate, uh, the move plate in the game. There followed h5. Anand is uh, storming his h pawn up the board, and uh, Nidic is defending against it by putting his rook behind uh, the enemy pawn. Here comes h4, and now Nidic plays a4. And um, although his position is already losing, I think this move speeds up the process actually, since Black's king turns out to be very capable in dealing with this free a pawn, as we shall soon see. It would have been tougher just to sit and wait with rook h8, for instance, since that forces Black to show how he will win this position instead of. Uh, for black just only having to react on white's pseudo activity. Okay, so back to a4. When h3 was played, 
a5 and now h2. And this, of course, means that if the pawn is on the second rank, uh, the white pieces don't have so much mobility anymore. We will uh, soon see uh, what this means. a6, and now a very nice subtle move by Anand, king c7, preventing white from taking on d6 with a check if he would go king uh, b6, for instance. Now after king c7, uh, knight is played rook h7 check, and after king b8, it becomes clear that Anand has foreseen everything. Because white will be in Zugzwang very soon. If the white rook moves vertically, so let's say to h6 or h5 or h4 for instance, then black will get to the a pawn. Let's just show that if the white rook moves anywhere along uh, the h file, then of course black will be able to go and block uh, the a pawn. If, however, uh, the rook moves horizontally, so let's say here, here, or here, for instance, then black moves his rook along the first rank, let's say he goes here, and then on the next move he obviously promotes the pawn, right? So that's also not a possibility for, um, for white. If the A pawn moves, for instance, it goes up the board, then it will be blocked by the black king. And last but not least, if the white king moves, which actually happens in the game, he will be harassed by the black uh, D pawn moving up. Okay, well, I guess that leaves for white only uh, the F pawn to be moved. But moving the F pawn opens up the second rank allowing for the all-important trick that black was able to set up with rook h1 check earlier. So if white were to play f2, f4 here, because all the other moves don't make any sense, can you now see how black can win this position? I'll give you five seconds and then we'll discuss the answer. One, two, three, Four, five. Of course, again, the well-known trick with rook a1 is now possible. This simply threatens to promote the pawn, so white is forced to take that pawn. But then, since now uh, the f pawn is no longer on f2, blocking the second rank, black can actually win the white rook by means of rook a2 check. So. Here it turns out that uh, white is really in, in a complete uh, Zugzwang. There are still some moves to continue the game, but at a certain moment the Zugzwang will become absolute. Let's see how uh, it transpires. So Anand played king b8, and knight is decided to move his king, king e2. But here goes d3 check. Now white cannot move vertically, he cannot take the pawn, for instance, because then another trick is possible, rook d1, check. And then after king e2, h1, queens, and black wins the game, of course. So after d3, check, knight each played king d2. But now Anand just played another very simple waiting move, king a8, and um, knight each played rook h5. And then Anand moved up the board, now threatening to take uh, the A pawn. And after rook h6, he played yet another fine move, completely paralyzing white here. It was possible for him here to play king takes a6, but that would lose the D pawn uh, to rook takes d6 check. It would probably be still uh, a winning position, but much better, much stronger is d5. And this is really the Zugzwang in optima forma. Now there followed rook h8, and now it was possible uh, for Anand to capture this uh, a pawn. And after rook h6 and king b5, um, it's, uh, it's an easy game. Black simply moves his king up the board to support the rest of his army and force uh, a breakthrough. So the final moves were rook h8, king c4, rook c8 check, king d4, rook h8, and king e4. And here, Nidic resigned. 
it's clear that uh, black will be able to move his king to f3 and uh, just take white's f-pawn or support his own h-pawn and win the game uh, easily. So, with that fine win, making use of, uh, well, a few slips by knight each there, uh, of course. Anand uh, was able to clinch uh, first, clear first in the Grenke Chess Classic in Baden-Baden. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this video and uh, learned something from it. And I see you soon in another video. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.